Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> time has come to listen to our second keynote speaker. The principle of the keynote speaker in this uh, dialogue is that we don't invite a person just because he's an expert, but because uh, that person will give us a different view, uh, and the, he or she embodies what he or she says. And this is uh, Jean uh, George Malbruno. Well, is clearly uh, can really uh, claim to be a, a keynote speaker. He's an expert in the Middle East for about 30 years now. He was based in Jerusalem between uh, 92 and 2003, following the Oslo Agreement and the peace process. Then he was in Baghdad in Iraq between the 2003 and 4, where he, you probably remember, he was held all stage together with Christian Cheno for 121 days. And uh, his uh, image appeared every night on the news. He saw uh, written about 12 days, most of them uh, written with Christian Cheno. The first book was published in 2002, de uh, dealing with the uh, Israel-Palestinian conflict from the stones to the guns. He talked about, he told, uh, he, he wrote the story about the way uh, the Intifada started. Then he wrote a book on Al Saddam Hussein, Al Qaeda, and the, the, uh, a book on the life of the bodyguard of Osama, Osama bin Laden. And they on Syria, on the Gulf countries, last book, still with Christian Chenot, is entitled French Degrading in the Middle East and in Maghreb, or the, in 2022. Georges Valbruno, you have the floor. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Admiral. I'm a bit, uh, it's a bit tricky for me because I usually deliver uh, conferences, but on a more conventional way on the topic I know best. Usually, well, I know, but, you know, I hope I'm knowledgeable in it. But yesterday, when I called you to ask you uh, what you expected from me, uh, you, you said, well, you have to, it's very much like if you were reading your testament. Well, I'm a bit young to write my testament. And uh, on my will, uh, uh, we, I could not say everything if I were to write my will in front of you, but uh, I will try to make my presentation more lively about the Middle East and the relationship I have with conflicts without uh, talking just about myself. You did mention it. I was a uh, conflict. Well, in 24, I was taken hostage in Iraq with Christian Chenot. In 2010, I was also uh, uh, tapped by the French uh, intelli uh, domestic intelligence service. And then in 2007, I was put on the Daesh kill list by an individual you might remember, Rashid Kassim, who, uh, who was specific that he, he came from Rouen, a city 30 kilometers of where I was born. And, uh, and every morning on his Telegram network, he had about 210 uh, subscribers or followers, and he would talk with them. And this gentleman was actually uh, uh, made recommendation, prescribed recommendation. He was at the origin of the uh, the triggering of the uh, killers of the priest in saint de Ouvray, and he was also at the origin of the mist or the failed terrorist attack against uh, Notre Dame by two young girls. So he is a person who, uh, that person was dangerous indeed. <laughs> and truly, well, on the one hand, I will, even though uh, I've gone through difficult times in my life, but, you know, I, I had, uh, I was a bit scared, but it reminded me in 2004 when I was at a host stage, I knew Iraq, uh, Christian and I had written books about it, and one of my fears, I said, yeah, one day we could end up dealing with, a, uh, facing a French person who will be uh, interrogating us. We knew that a lot of French citizens uh, had joined the uh, Islamic army, so it did not take place, but I was, uh, you know, understanding this French threat. 
uh, transposed in Iraq and Syria, and uh, which was actually threatening French citizens, me and others. This man was drawn by the Americans a couple of uh, a while later, so 2016, 2017, the uh, threats uh, posed uh, by the Islamic State was uh, uh, significantly reduced. Well, the territorial threats, because they, uh, they no longer had any territory in C Iraq and uh, Syria where they could uh, uh, impose terror and export their, uh, their murderers who would then uh, commit um, terrorist attack in France or elsewhere. So from then on, in 2017-18, we had a feeling in the Middle East that the conflictuality was lesser. Uh, the Israel-Palestine Israel conflict was a low-intensity one. On a regular basis, there would be Israeli operations in Gaza following rocket firings from the Hamas. All this uh, led to massive destructions. Uh, the Qatari allied and uh, uh, allied of uh, Hamas and uh, Israel would uh, finance uh, reconstruction, would enable the Gaza Bank and its two million inhabitants to survive and to uh, get food and so on and so forth. So we were. We were in, um, in some kind of uh, sordid, uh, you know, three-player game. But uh, for the Israeli, it was a neither war, neither peace uh, climate. And therefore, Netanyahu could weaken the Palestinian Authority and to have a proto-state uh, in Gaza with the Hamas, who gave the impression to, to have uh, somewhat uh, uh, watered down its charter and even when I discussed with Syria, Sino of his advisors, Hamad, uh, Hamad Hazi, who is, was in Beirut, who was a person that I would see on a regular basis, and he was considered as a kind of, uh, well, respectable and moderate. And that uh, our agent from the GDC, the French uh, Domestic Intelligence Service, uh, would see on a regular basis, but today he has a more uh, difficult to speech. So anyway, since our diplomacies who didn't know, uh, which didn't know how to deal with this conflict, well, uh, would uh, hide, uh, the, you know, behind the tree, and let's hope it will last long enough. Basically, in the last few months, we've seen that the Iranians and the Saudi uh, got closer, uh, have now diplomatic relationship. The uh, in, the prince. Uh, um, MBS knows that he needs stability if he has his uh, 2030 vision uh, plan, uh, which is remarkable. That's why uh, I'm not one of those who say when he comes and sees uh, President Macron, we should not welcome him. Of course, we have to welcome him. We have to host him, uh, Mohamed Ben Salman. Of course, uh, there is a dark side to it. But MBS understood, especially following the Iraqi attacks of uh, September 2019, or against the Aramco facilities that Iran had the facility to destroy his project. So Iran, Saudi Arabia uh, went into reconciliation officially. The Gulf states, uh, Arabia, Emirates, Egypt, Bahrain, well, reconciled themselves with, uh, with Qatar. And, um, and, uh, and therefore, we had a feeling we had the feeling that this Middle East uh, had entered a, a zone of, uh, of peace. And you remember in 2020, there was the Abraham Agreement, uh, which, uh, well, which made it possible to uh, enable Israel to normalize its uh, relationship with the um, United Arab Emirates, Morocco, Bahrain, and Sudan. Well, this agreement was well received by the international community, which was only a bargain, you know, uh, between the leaders and not people. And, uh, and which comprised, well, which left aside the Palestinian cause. Well, this uh, Israel-Palestine conflict is a bit of a uh, nuisance. We don't know how to deal with it, how to get out of it. So anyway, so let's support the Abraham Agreement, and we'll see. On a regular basis, I mean, you know, I was invited to 
to the uh, Seven Twenty Four News, the French-speaking uh, world news channel, and uh, and the Israelis know me. Uh, they know that I'm not necessarily uh, um, always lenient to them. Uh, you know, I don't always agree with what they do, but you know, I'm the I'm the usual. Uh, uh, non circumcised man of the of the, the, the of uh, the purpose and the six months ago I told them you know you are full of illusions you are fooling yourself you signed the Abraham agreements with countries with which you've never had any conflict you were sort of neighbors of, you know, United Arab Emirates. Well, in 2010, when I was uh, uh, tapped by the Iranian intelligence system in f service in France, following an investigation which was quite uh, bold, but which was through on the purchasing of its Israeli uh, weapons being bought by the Emirates. We knew that uh, the Emirates and uh, Israel were not uh, enemies. Morocco and Israel, well, we know that. You know, they've had uh, uh, defense agreements since 1967. I said to the Israeli, OK, fair enough. You, you've you been able to normalize your relationship. But you tend to forget that uh, there is a, there is a, a tripod, uh, you know, in this equation, and which is not there, which is the Palestinian coast. Oh, no, no, don't worry. Saudis will come. And uh, and therefore, we don't see why it wouldn't work. And I would to say I was I would tell them, you are creating South of Gaza a Hezbollah base. What is your strategic vision for the Gaza Strip in ten years, fifteen years? Bearing in mind that, knowing that uh, you know you in two thousand two. When I talked about the from stones to guns, you know, I used to go to the Gaza Strip, and one of my sub chapter, the sub chapter of my book, was entitled "The uh, Cemetery of the Damas uh, uh, Rockets." You know, a cemetery which was uh, the the Arafat uh, police force. They fight, fought against the Hamas, and they would uh, collect the bombs and the uh, rockets from the Hamas, the Qassam, which were, you know, at one, two, three kilometers of range, and therefore one out of two was fired from Gaza or from uh, from the north of the Gaza Strip, which today is being bombed, and they would not even land in Israel. So I used to tell the, my Israeli friends, you know, 20 years ago, you had 1 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Now it's 2.3. Now, 20 years ago, the Hamas rockets had 2 kilometer range. Today, they have 150 kilometer range. So what's your vision for the next 10 years? What uh, will you, what is your scenario for the Gaza Strip? Because it's an open sky prison and the nature uh, hating, you know, nature doesn't accept uh, emptiness or void, you know, the Hamas people inside, and then, uh, you know, uh, ill intentioned allied, you know, Iran, the Hezbollah, and uh, well, you know, they came and, uh, you know, came to help Ham the Hamas and make it, made it possible to improve the uh, operational capabilities of this uh, Islamist movement. So, but the Israeli friends said, no, no, don't worry, Gaza is under control. You know, we, we control the situation. We, you know, we, but indeed, I think uh, there was a, as often I said, I think there was some kind of a, Israel was a victim of its, uh, of its uh, uh, complex of overpower. Of, because after following the second intifada, Israel won the second intifada. Yasser Arafat uh, made a mistake. He made this, uh, uh, uprising, uh, mi uh, he gave it military. So the Hamas, you know, uh, organized, um, you know, murderous uh, suicide, and Europe was in a position, difficult position, and such that Europe placed, well, put Hamas on the list of uh, terrorist organizations. So the Hamas ended up some ended up being isolated in its little corner. And uh, 
did a sort of a make it uh, your do it yourself uh, rockets, you know, because Israel had won the second intifada, the Hamas in the years when I based in Jerusalem from ninety four to two thousand two, what one level for terrorist action on Israel, it was to, to commit a terrorist attack in buses, you know, they would have uh, kamikaze would get on a bus, there would be twenty dead, you know. Sometimes there were uh, uh, retaliation terrorism following uh, Israeli military actions. 27th of February 2094, uh, 1994, when a, a colon, uh, a member of the colony killed uh, 27 faithful in the Hebron mosque. And of course, to annoy the uh, Yasser Arafat because the Hamas wanted to damage the peace process and uh, undermine the uh, Palestinian Authority. So once there was no longer any peace process, the Hamas did not commit any uh, terrorist attack and concentrated on the management of the Gaza Strip. And they had expelled the, the people from Yasser Arafat in 2007 following uh, um, an oper combined operation done by the Palestinian Authority and uh, uh, with the support of some the intelligence service to kill the Hamas. Uh, well, the, the Hamas got, got the whole, hold of it, well, knew about it, so, and uh, after that, the, the Hamas, following that, the Hamas went to Gaza, had won the election, that the Israel community uh, the, the made a mistake the, that they did not recognize the election. It wasn't a good message sent to the, uh, to the to the Hamas, but anyway, they were on the list of terrorist organizations, so it was a bit tricky. So from then on, the Hamas went underground because they, in every meaning of the word, and uh, has increased the range of its uh, rockets with the support of the Hezbollah. Uh, it was just after the assassination of Qasem Soleimani in 20, January 2020 by the Americans in Baghdad. Well. There was an interesting reportage from Al Jazeera, which interviewed a Hamas leader in Beirut, and he had explained the qualitative support provided by the Hezbollah in details and by the Iranians. And we discovered then that Qasem Soleimani, the uh, the leader of the Al Iranian Al Quds force of the armed arm of the uh, uh, borders had gone to Gaza. I remember, I was in Gaza in the 20, uh, 2020, 2000. Sorry, uh, I would ask uh, the gentleman who was in charge of uh, oh, oh, being well informed. Do we have information about the uh, Iranian presence in Gaza? Everybody was looking for that. You know, we couldn't find it. Qasem Soleimani had come to Gaza. I think it was in 2012 in Marmor Diem, you know, all the boy of the terrorism killed by the Israeli in 2008 had come to Gaza as well beforehand. So, the again, you know, uh, tunnels uh, became more comfortable, uh, rockets uh, grew in range, and uh, and we ended up with this tragedy of uh, October 7. Now. What I find striking is to the the because of this tragedy and even before in the in the French narratives, but not only, but uh, in the of, not in the official narrative, but for us journalists, is that in fact we've lost our memory. We we, be, we you know our memory is failing. In the last few years, when I would talk with young journalists. The Palestinian cause, Yasser Arafat. Let's not talk about George Abash. I wrote his memories in 2006 because, you know, those are uh, individuals who are totally ignored or unknown. Well, they who said, oh, but you know, Palestinian cause is over. You know, Israel will be friend with the, uh, with the Arab countries. We were like in a sort of uh, uh, sort of snapshot analysis, uh, which, and, and the last crisis has shown that. Today we, well, journalists, but also the political leaders, unfortunately, well, we, we are in the world of emotion. Now, you know, the realm of emotion, you know, it's like, 
And we leave aside the context, the explanations, and so on and so forth. So this leads us to, led us to, and including recently, but of course uh, before that, to, which led us to, to make mistakes. I mean, when you, uh, I wrote it in a book called The Road to Damas, on the, uh, on the difficult relationship between France and Syria, how did we end up? Uh, having a poor, a wrong reading of the situation in the uh, Foreign Office Department. I mean, not so much in the, with the military because, you know, they, but anyway, you remember the, we, we changed our position as 2011, whereas Bashar al-Assad was our best ally until 2011. Then he became our worst enemy because we had to make sure that this uh, old friendship had to be uh, forgotten. So we had to be spearheading the revolution. So Bashar al-Assad, you know, his days are uh, counted, you know, Fabius, Juppé, and so on and so forth. So, and it is also uh, within the same sort of scope of emotion that what happened in Iran as of uh, fall 2022, we were naive. And let's face it, up to the highest level of the when the President of the Republic uh, hosted four young Iranian women, most of them had left Iran for a long time, and, and he called them revolutionaries. I was quite amazed. I was amazed because I've known Iran for 25 years. I know, well, very much like Syria, I know its, uh, capa uh, its resilience capabilities, which is much higher than that of Damas, and, uh, and the safety system, the security system that the, uh, the, 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 the Muslim power has over the population. So we got somewhat, uh, you know, overexcited, uh, you know, saying, well, the regime, the regime will fall, the regime will fall because it's the revolution and so on and so forth. No, it was not the revolution. Uh, oh, if you interviewed Jean-Claude Gousserand, who was uh, stationed, the former uh, manager of DGSC and best expert in the Middle East, and we still is very, uh, uh, who has, can see clear, when see clear, and when the, and he says that uh, the, the Shura of 1978, there were 500,000 people in the, in the street. In Iran, uh, our, the, our current ambassador, who is not exactly a friend of the regime, says, uh, he said to, there's never been a, a, a huge demonstration in Iran. And, and this is what I wrote as well. But it's difficult to, uh, to to be right. It's difficult to be right against everybody else, and uh, to be in re cold real politics when you are on a on a television set with young, uh, facing young uh, people who have a beautiful uh, cause to uh, fight for Syrians versus uh, uh, dictatorship, power, you know, or Iranian. And no, no, it's, that's not the way it's going to go because we, you don't have 500,000 people in Tehran in the street. In 2009, I was in Tehran when following the uh, fake elections or uh, there was one Friday which for uh, 2 million people were in the street, you know, in the, uh, well, the regime there was uh, the, um, jeopardized, you know, there were uh, helicopters were ready to evacuate the Supreme Guide. With 2 million people in the street, you got some kind of a revolution in progress. And this is why, always oh, said last year, uh, the, the action is revolutionary because you got uh, today, uh, I was I was there in May. I was one of the few journalists to be able to go to to be able to go to Iran. You got about 50 percent of Iranian women who no longer wear the veil in in Tehran. So the this uh, the fight to, to remove this veil is revolutionary. But the time was not because there was not this mass phenomenon, and it will become revolutionary. Where will be the junction between the young pe women, the students, which today are. Uh, you know, uh, under uh, our repress, you know, there there will be junction between the young people and social classes, the masses, which uh, you know are facing uh, problems. But today, when I was in Tehran, I would ask my Iranian friends, their businessmen, their taxi drivers, why don't 
what do you think of the young people? Well, we support them, we support them, morally speaking, but we won't go with them because we don't know what tomorrow will be. You know, we, uh, we've seen Syria, we've seen Iraq, and we know that this regime is very resilient. So, again, one year later, well, the, reg the Iranian regime is still here, fairly solid, because it is a regime which is uh, which has shrunk to itself in the last two, three years, uh, which was scared. So he shrank on to people who are uh, people who are decided to save their heads, but they're also capable of. Uh, uh, they are aware of some realities, and they may give a bit of a leeway uh, to the girls in the streets. And because you know, 15%, well, could be if it is a, uh, uh, if they're a bit, uh, you know, have some clarity, they could do with the veil what they did with the, with the television uh, dishes. You know, uh, in Iran they are officially uh, prohibited, but all Iranians have a television dish in their homes. So, so they're ignoring the fact. Anyway, just to tell you that it is unfortunately a, a sort of an indicator of our diplomacy. Well, it's not uh, just uh, 2017, but 2016. Uh, we we've lost this uh, acute uh knowledge of this region maghreb and middle east we've lost this fine acute knowledge and uh which avoided a disaster in 2003 when uh, jacques chirac uh, uh opposed france to the uh, us iraq uh, uh invasion which was a game changer for the region. Likewise, in 1996, that's why I say often we talked about, uh, you know, degrading of France. You know, I mean, if we go and look, look into the past, the last two successes in terms of extent, uh, foreign policy in the Middle East, 2002, Chirac says no to the U.S. invasion uh, in Iraq, and 96, a uh, grape of ro wrath, uh, rocket firing between uh, Israel and the Hezbollah, and I was based in Jerusalem at the time. I was in the north. And you remember Chirac, uh, who is the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, the, Ch uh, the Charette in the region. The Charette is doing the shuttling. And Chirac is brave enough to play Affaires et l'Azad contre Shimon Peres. And he ends up imposing France as within the marginal security mechanism uh, next to the uh, United States and, uh, and France imposed itself in this regional security mechanism, which for the first time would put side by side Iranians, Hezbollah, and Israel. So that was brave, that was bold, because there would have been the Kana massacre, which had placed uh, Shimon Peres in a dire situation when the Hezbollah attracted him in a, in a trap when they fired a rocket near a village, and there was this uh, uh, Israeli retaliation, you know, are causing 100 deaths. But anyway, uh, so there's been uh, some courage on the French side to say, okay, well, uh, we are not against the state of Israel, but we consider that uh, this is not good. So it was this courage and this uh, and the and the sort of a more blurry vision of the region, and uh, uh, which is which of course is uh, is negative. And I think the, they can explain them. This can be explained by power stru power struggles. There are a couple of diplomats here from the foreign office, uh, French foreign office. So uh, uh, they, there will be a change of struggle in the Quai d'Orsay when the Afrique du Nord Middle East uh, man, uh, direction threat lost. Uh, ground uh, versus the strategic affairs direction, and uh, and uh, 
and they took over and they marginalized this North African MENA region and uh, uh, the MENA region. And today, this department is pushed aside within the Kedose, which, as you know, is also marginalized by the uh, Elise Palace, by the hyperactive president, who often has good idea, who is very good, uh, pr dynamic, pragmatic, but who is very much like uh, his uh, predecessors, especially Nicolas Rollet, in some kind of uh, uh, who is uh, following the dictatorship of instantaneity. Uh, what well, I reproach of the president since 2007 is to conceive the uh, French foreign policy in the Middle East and elsewhere as a lever to strengthen its position <clears throat> over the inter internal politics. By uh, uh, The foreign policy is not something that can be decided upon, and it, it takes time. And the best example is uh, maybe you'll remember in 2020 the courageous in initiatives of Emmanuel Macron, who went to Beirut after the explosion uh, on the port of Beirut, who went there with a lot of um, was very uh, uh, with a with a purpose, a strong purpose, a lot of ideas, uh, and but maybe a bit too quick, and that led to a failure of this initiative, uh, and um, it was too hasty, an uh, initiative that couldn't work uh, for several reasons. In fact, uh, firstly, when you're faced with uh, uh, people who have uh, 30 years of civil war, 20 years in power, uh, people who have a thick skinned, show you how they breathe, who agree, uh, want to take control of all the resources in Lebanon, you know, uh, you have to have that in mind. You have to bear that in mind because, and then, uh, you know, uh, there's a kind of gesticulation, a lack of. Uh, Maybe I will to go too fast, too hastily, not necessarily with an objective in uh, Lebanon. The president of the republic uh, had the good idea of when he went there for the first time to invite the Hezbollah uh, around the table uh, where he told them that they had to make reforms. You may like or dislike the, the Hezbollah, but you can't reform Lebanon without the Hezbollah. Uh, but anyway, at the same time, to use uh, an expression that the president likes enough, I think we should have involved other countries and also have better relationships with Iran, uh, which is the, the godfather of uh, Hezbollah. So there's a kind of, uh, of uh, blur, uh, fog, uh, a, bit, a lot of mistakes uh, were made, which uh, led to the point where our position in the region is uh, misunderstood often. Uh, and um, behind this uh, uh, this um, background, there's, with a view to the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, for France anyway, we've seen this since the 7th of October, um, there's a kind of repositioning, which is quite clear in the sense that the President of the Republic President of the National Assembly have uh, clearly taken a stand besides Israel, which was a victim of a, a barbarian a terrorist attack. But at the same time, I think we it would have been a good idea to show towards Arab countries uh, a particular attention, send our Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, to say, yes, okay, we're, we uh, support Israel. They have the right to defend themselves. But parallel to that, we know you're there. We know that the uh, Palestinian uh, question is an issue. Uh, but there, was, there were signs that were sent uh, by France that were very poorly received in the region. And I must uh, recognize that the idea of creating, uh, extending the anti-ISIS coalition uh, to, to the Hamas uh, that was proposed to, to by the President of the Republic was, well, you know, I took maybe two or three days of vacation in Rome, but I was following the events. Uh, and when I uh, 
uh, was informed of all that, I must admit that I was uh, uh, flabbergasted. I was uh, because um, the idea of the lack of potential in there. I called uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rome, and he couldn't believe that. Um, and um, based on what we understood with our friends at the Kiddo State, they were short-circuited. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was short-circuited. So this, this idea, which is um, behind us now, you know, it's a, uh, but it cast a shadow on uh, the French approach uh, towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but also gives the impression that there are it, it, it's a two double standard position. Uh, you know, when Amman in Beirut, we saw the reaction of the King of Jordan and the Queen, uh, who is the uh, most pro West uh, leader, half English, uh, with an English mother, and uh, his father, King Hussein, uh, was very close to the Israeli. Um, intelligence services. We saw the King Abdullah of Jordan during the meeting in Cairo just after the 7th of October. It was very harsh words um, against the position of the, of the West, uh, saying we understood our lives are weightless compared to uh, Israeli lives, double standard, but it's a very dangerous development. When King Abdullah says that, uh, the Queen uh, uh, added another layer on CNN. It's a couple that's uh, very pro-West, even too much uh, in the opinion of many Jordans, uh, Jordanians, I'm sorry, but I think we're on a very tight rope here. And the perception today of France in the countries of the region is that we uh, we apply a double standard. The president recalled they reminded that uh, Israeli life was worth the Palestinian life uh, and, and and vice versa. But uh, but I or French life. But I I think we are considered now we've lost again some of our influence. Uh, we saw some protests, uh, marches, and some. Uh, reactions. Uh, it's regrettable because France has a role to play. It has a good diplomacy, important military presence. Uh, but um, I, I think that it must recover. It's our late motive, but we're preaching in the desert uh, because it's not very trendy nowadays, but it has to recover its original voice an original voice that will help us appear as a recourse, not necessarily a recourse, but a different support uh, with the other European countries, with less uh, less noise, maybe more depth. That's what I find regrettable in our position uh, to, to conclude, because we're going to move to the question, the Q&A. But um, what's happening in the war between Israel and uh, Hamas is uh, very dangerous for us, because uh, I find that the, the press, the media, uh, more specifically the, the television, they play a role uh, as an accelerator of the polarization uh, with the Jewish community, those who defend Israel, and the Muslim community, and those who defend the Palestinians. And... Um, so it, uh, we should abs never contribute to import this conflict. This conflict, and what we do, including us journalists uh, or some media, by uh, taking a stand, taking a position. Uh, when I'm on e even for news, the French channel, I'm a Zionist. In Haifa, Tel Aviv, and West Jerusalem, the security of Israel is something. Uh, to which we're, uh, we're very much attached. But I'm anti-Zionist in the settlements in Kirat Arba, in Fertakwa, and, and elsewhere. I'm not. It doesn't mean I'm an anti-Semitist. Uh, I'm, I'm in the same position as Jack Rabin or Joe Biden. And we shouldn't take a stand, Take a, instinctively uh, take a stand. We're not really much helped by uh, our politicians where we have one uh, polit polit political group uh, 
who refused to say that the acts, the the the, the action, the, the operation of the seventh of October was not a terrorist attack. Well, you know, I think we need to step back, and that's what the Arab world doesn't understand. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to someone from Lebanon, who was telling me, <clears throat> we talk of the seventh of October in France, but we don't say what's happened, was happening before the settlements. Uh, and all that. It's a debate that no longer exists in the media. And we don't talk about what happened after the 7th of October, the bombing of Gaza and so on and so forth. So to conclude, um, I'm at the same time, I'm pessimistic on our position, our capacity to, uh, to uh, reestablish the links with this region, an important region. Uh, we trade our weapons with this uh, armament, with this uh, uh, this region. Our diplomacy is a, a security, military uh, relationship. We have sold a lot of web of armament to Egypt, uh, to Israel. Uh, it shouldn't be the only success in our diplomacy, but we have to be careful because we are a bit declassified or degraded. Questions? With a microphone, please. We don't have a microphone. Uh, Hello, Thomas Baslek. I'm a student in geopolitics. Yes, your microphone's working. Tell, the ge tell this young man that the microphone's on. He probably turned it off now, but switch it off. Yes, okay. It was just to ask you, I was uh, at the honor of working at the Museum of M Navy. I'm a student in international geopolitics. And three or four years ago, just before the COVID pandemic, I uh, uh, attended a press conference or a conference of a specialist on Iran, of Iran, who was saying that the Westerners are full of illusions on the, the issue of the atomic bomb for, for Iran, because Iran is first and foremost uh, nationalistic. And even if the re regime of the Mullahs should collapse, which will not happen, him alive, even with that, we would still have problems with Iran, because would still, Iran would still want for its prestige uh, with this uh, quote-unquote Gaulism to uh, to uh, make sure that it would secure the atomic bomb. Uh, it's, not, it's not false. Go back to history, the Shah, before the Mullahs add nuclear ambitions. And uh, I think that if uh, there uh, was a, 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 another regime in Iran, it would uh, probably be tempted to, uh, to, to, to have this uh, nuclear capacity to protect itself. We know that it's really at the limit. They have the capacity and know-how. But uh, just a story that a uh, uh, former French diplomat, very famous, but I uh, won't mention, the, give his name, he was an ambassador in the United States, who a conference uh, with the Iranian Jew Jewish community. Uh, so the Iranian uh, nuclear power is a, a, a something that uh, the French diplomacy has been covering for a long time. So he proposed, he did this conference uh, before uh, uh, the Iranians of the diaspora. So France was fighting strongly for the disarmament, nuclear disarmament. And two hands were raised, and they said, why shouldn't Iran have the right to have its atomic bomb? And so it's part of this uh, Iranian will, which is very old, because Iran considers itself as an empire, as a... Uh, uh, surround or threaten in its existence. And it's part of the Iranian nationalist movement or state of mind. I have the microphone. Yes, it's working. The microphone is working. Tell the gentleman the microphone is working. So I'm a journalist, specialist in the Middle East, a little less than you are. I just came back from Lebanon a week ago. I have a question. 
uh, in a two, two tier. I was one of the leaders of the 17th of October movement, the 17th of October, the revolution movement. You said that with 500,000 people, we can pretend to say it was, it was a revolution. We had two million people in the streets. 50% of the Lebanese population was in the streets. And despite that, you mentioned it, when President Macron arrived in, in Lebanon, he went to sit with the other, with the Hezbollah and the other representatives, and he told us at the time that he was with them because they were legally elected. Since he, I did law studies in Paris, so he, Macron didn't study law, and it doesn't make a difference between legitimate and legal. You can vote with your feet, and that uh, two million people voting with their feet, they ha are legitimate. And he withdrew the legitimacy of, and he gave the legitimacy to the corrupted uh, power. The people have the knowledge of people. All the Lebanons are the, uh, are the victims of thieves. So the other part of my question, uh, again, in line with what you, what you said, we don't, don't we didn't do what, look at what was happening before the seventh of seventh of October, and after the seventh of October, we ignore the fact that five hundred thousand people are being terrorized, that ten thousand people were killed. So my question is, France, first of all, and the EU, continue for you to be without any capacity in the Middle East. Uh, is completely incapable of doing anything. The second part of my question is France losing the Middle East as it lost the largest part of Africa. No, we're not losing. Uh, no, we talked about being degraded corresponds to reality, but France, again, still has assets in Lebanon and elsewhere. Uh, I would even if it uh, may sound shocking. I, I, on the revolutionary capacity of the Lebanese people, I'm not too sure this can lead anywhere. I've known this country for a long time. It's my opinion. I did not really believe in the Lebanese revolution that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's faced with a, com a country that's fractured between communities and everything. No, I think... Back to France has uh, uh, its word to say in Lebanon, and I think this uh, small country has uh, some uh, major electors, France, Saudi Arabia, Iran, the U.S. I think we should have a concerted action. Uh, uh, of course, Iran plays a very important role via the Hezbollah. We like it, whether we like it or not. But they were elected. They were elected, and the... Uh, political branch of the Hezbollah was elected in France. Maybe I'm a little hard on France, but Macron uh, understood well that you, even though he's subject to a lot of pressure to uh, place the political branch of the Hezbollah on the list of the terrorist organization. But if we put everybody or a lot of people on the, this list, who will we talk with? You know, it's the problem of the, the, the diplomacy and the, this uh, lack of intimate knowledge of the field. Uh, it's a, sort of like a neo-American, neo-conservatist approach. We don't like you, so you're on the list of terrorist organizations. The Hezbollah was elected. It does have an army that's way more uh, powerful than the Lebanese army. This is a problem, but uh, I think we need to keep uh, the discussion open with them uh, to bring them back to the table with more realism. Uh, it's what the Hezbollah did. You know, the president uh, the, the Republic didn't like uh, some of my papers, or and he was a bit upset. Uh, but he, he was right to say that um, to be with the Hezbollah and say, we need you and help us to change Lebanon. And to a certain extent, they were ready. And, um, I forgot to tell you earlier, but uh, the former Iraqi uh, prime minister, uh, Mustafa Kezaki, a fine person, probably the best pr prime minister or the least bad that uh, Iraq has had. So he has good relationships with Emmanuel Macron. They launched this initiative of Baghdad, the meeting of the countries of the region with the president of the republic. Not bad. And I, they said, you have to understand in France, stop looking at the Middle East with your eyes 
of French people try to consider our region with the eyes of Iraqis, of Arabs. Uh, it's back to, that's what I find so bad in the French attitude today, or so, so sorry to see that. We look at this region with our own criteria, you know. We don't uh, debate the, the on uh, uh, the, the lake position or secular positions. It's a difficult thing to make uh, understood. The Gulf countries invest. They buy influences in France. It's not illegal. And their uh, wives come to Paris and uh, wearing their niqab. But the Gulf is not the France. It's not Luxembourg. It's not Switzerland. The Gulf countries are not the same. So we need to accept these countries think differently, act differently. The, um, villages on behaviors. Uh, 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 you know, uh, the president was uh, mentioned the idea of the financing of some organizations in France by Qatar, for example. But we have to recover all that. To, to recover this knowledge of this intimacy of the region. We lost that uh, because uh, the uh, people in Cairo was more marginalized. Uh, some, uh, it's too bad. It's too bad that we lost this, uh, this insight. Back to the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Don't you think that some of these conflicts are absolutely impossible to solve. We're thinking of the solution with the two-state solution, but there's a spatial temp time uh, problem here. The solution at the beginning of the 1970s where the territories were uh, 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 a line for peace, but today we think it's impossible to have this two-state solution. It's not the attacks of the Hamas in Israel against the kibbutzins that are rather uh, left-wing uh, for peace that will uh, encourage uh, government, even if it uh, uh, centrists to, to, to free the territories five kilometers uh, uh, from Tel Aviv in the West Bank. Now, that's what the, the, the settlers in, uh, from Gaza uh, say, you know, when they were evacuated from Gaza. Well, in fact, yes, I think that the, um, the pleas for, from all the Western representatives, uh, Joe Biden and so on and so forth, they no longer believe on this solution of two states. Emmanuel Macron would love to see the two-state uh, solution as the best solution, but it's no longer possible with the 450,000 settlers who live in the West Bank. Well, this being, so what's the solution for this conflict, Israel-Palestinian? A lot of, you know, many, Options for the earthquake, <laughs> which the earthquake, which would eliminate one of the two camps. Yeah, you know, something like that. Uh, the transfer of populations, mm -hmm. Palestinians probably. The idea that came up uh, in the past uh, with the Likud, Jordan is Palestine. That big fear of the King of Jordan, uh, reactivated by some Israeli. Uh, leaders, and we saw Blinken yesterday who said there will be no popular population transfer, notably the people from Gaza. Uh, yeah, if we could send them in the Sinai, no way. So if we want to solve that problem is share the land. That was the basis of the peace process, land for peace. Uh, we Palestinians stop um, uh, attacking you and you Israelis give us back the land. The land, you must remember in 67, there was a war invasion and the West Bank, the East Jer uh, West Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, there were uh, UN resolutions. And since then, France just sat on these resolutions, which uh, call for a, a withdrawal from the Palestinian territories. But a certain number of countries today, uh, you know, whether from the global south or not, uh, you mobilize uh, to defend the, the Ukraine, aggressed by Russia, but in Israel and Palestine, it's been 70 years the West has not done nothing. Sharing the land. I was based in Jerusalem from 1993 to 2002. I was witness to the birth and death, uh, day after day, of the process. At the beginning, there were people, Shimon Peres, Chak Rabin. Rabin was not a dove. 
He was a fighter, he was a soldier, but who converted to peace, to the necessity of making concessions landwise. He was uh, assassinated, killed by a Jewish extremist because uh, they thought that it was the way to stop the peace process. But what struck me, continues to strike me, is when you make peace, we made peace with Germany after, as French, I consider you, German, as an equal. And I say that to my Israeli friends. I say, careful, because you are superior militarily speaking, no doubt. Diplomatically, no doubt. Media, with the media side, no doubt. You have a, a leading edge because you're supported by the international community. But when you make peace, when you're committed in the process, it's like the 1993 process with all its defects, well, you need to, the gap between both nations has to be limited. And even at the time, there was the priest process that uh, showed its limits as of 1996. Um, Netanyahu stopped the priest process, blocked the, spe the peace process. So after, this is what I keep saying you know, to all the people who, say, yeah, it's complicated, difficult, we don't understand anything in this story. If you want to understand this conflict, you have to understand history and geography. History, Zionism, the pogroms, and geography, just go in the field. Go to Taifa, Haifa, go to Tel Aviv, Ramallah, Bethlehem. And if possible, you go to Gaza. It's difficult, complicated, and you'll see that nothing has changed. The conditions, the living conditions of the uh, Palestinians have deteriorated. The settlings, uh, settlement, that's where the, the international community is guilty. Today, the uh, U.S. say we have to think of the post-Gaza period. Oh, of course, we have to think about it. There'll be an end to this war. Uh, the post-Gaza situation, we can go back to the status quo. No, it's impossible that the Hamas would lead or run uh, the Gaza or manage the Gaza. So who? Uh, will intervene, uh, Egypt. Uh, no, no Arab country today is ready to send uh, forces in the Gaza Strip. And the Palestinian Authority, which was, uh, played the game, you know, they, from 1993 to 2000, with the, sometimes, Yasser Arafat changed his mind or things, but he was stuck between the attacks of the Hamas and Israel, and Netanyahu wanted to make no gifts. But today, uh, for the U.S., nobody wants to go and help them to s say, what, what are we going to do with Gaza after for a long time? That's why I talk of, um, that's what Dominique Moise says, you will make peace only if you're forced to make peace. Even Jaha, who was a great friend of Israel, wrote that in his book, Israel, it's not in the interest of Israel to make peace. The cost of occupation in terms of victims was very low. It was less than uh, car accidents, you know. Um, and the occupation, we, f it's, we finance the occupation. International community in Europe, it's our money that finances the, the Palestinian Authority. And the thirdly, an occupation enables to have wonderful intelligence services, wonderful private security companies who, once they leave the Mossad, create uh, private security companies installing uh, cameras in Nice, in France, all over the place, who sell their incredible equipment, Mohammed bin Salman, to hear, to listen to its uh, opponents, to Bahrain, to Qatar, uh, uh, experts. So Israel has lived under the illusion that it didn't need to make peace. So the question now is to know, today, are the Israelis ready to step back? Very complicated, in my opinion, because they, they're they traumatized by what happened with the pogrom of the 7th of October. But it's what I told them before. If you have, if you have, don't have a strategic vision of Gaza, <laughs> you will have a, a second Hezbollah instead of uh, Hamas. You will have ISIS. Remember that uh, Hamas in 2007-2008, uh, inside the arm, uh, arm of uh, Hamas, they uh, wanted to be tougher than uh, against Israel. So Hamas, some left 
uh, via the tunnel, and they joined ISIS in the Sinai because they weren't happy with the the the, uh, the softness of Hamas. So there's no strategic division by Israelis. Uh, our Israeli friends are remarkably intelligent. They have the very good uh, intelligence services, but they need to have a strategic vision beyond two or three months. And if they had had this uh, strategic vision, they would have made peace with Yasser Arafat, Mohamed Dalan, Jibril Rajul, uh, the uh, French uh, intelligence uh, services. You know, we're in Gaza, they in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. Uh, they really collaborated with the Shin Bet very, very, very intensely. And that's the reason why today Dalan, who is uh, uh, in the Emirates, um, who could be a recourse for Gaza, a lot of coverage if he enters Gaza, uh, where his uh, people uh, killed uh, uh, Islamic forces there. He has a very low life expectancy. So we had to make peace with Arafat, with Darlan, with Rajoub, and so on and so forth. And so it, and uh, I need to have a bit of optimism. Today there are people like Benny Gantz in Israel. And even it's interesting to follow declarations of the leaders of the Mossad the minute they leave the Mossad, because when they're Mossad, they don't say a word. But when they leave, they say very just the re uh, correct things. Uh, Ephraim Alevi said a few years ago that the existential threat of uh, Israel is not Iran, it's the Hamas. Comme ça, demain. Well, a person like that uh, could play a role tomorrow. So uh, uh, I think uh, this is, well, you know, you 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 were delusional, you know, you had the Abraham Agreement, you know. But remember the World Cup in last year in Qatar, well, when the Israeli journalists were in Doha, they wanted to interview the Arabs. Then they said, no, no, first you, you sign, sign peace with Palestinians, then we'll discuss, we'll talk here, you know. And uh, uh, we understand, but, I, uh, you know, I said it's very easy to understand. S sign peace with the Palestinians, co come back to us, and the, uh, the Arab world will accept you. But, uh, well, we'll accept you. We, because it is one of the paradox of the situation when you go to Saudi Arabia or 60% or of the youth is under 30. Well, I talked about the ignorance of young French people for the young Arabs, you know, uh, Rafat, you know, Israel is there. They acknowledge that Qatar, even in Qatar, so, uh, in Emirates, uh, were the same. And, uh, and even... Uh, in Jordan, of course, they signed peace. So Israel is now accepted in the in 2002. Remember, you know, at the end of the Intifada, or in the middle of the Intifada, the king of Dallah of Saudi Arabia uh, came with a silver tray to Ayanshan to create a Palestinian state against versus the peace with 22 Arab states. And Ariel Sharon said no. So, so at one stage, I think we. Uh, we we have to stand back, otherwise, you know, uh, otherwise uh, our Israeli friends will uh, will will face a more serious problem. You know, what happened on October seventh? Uh, so uh, could happen in the north with Hezbollah. So I'm back to you know. You have to know the geography. Go to the site. And I could mention examples of French people who are accompanied, you know, and saying, oh, I'm pro Israeli, and our friends, well, they went around, they said, What we've seen. No, no, we have to stop with that. We have to stop with that. We cannot maintain two million uh, uh, of people under the, the uh, in, in this situation. And the, the awakening was fairly brutal. And what's bad for us as well is that. Uh, and I'm back to our position, which is uh, uh, needs to be questioned because today in the Arab world, and uh, people look at the television, they look at Algeria, they see in France there is a strong polarization, and that the pro-Palestinians, you know, which, who are not necessarily pro-Hamas, by the way, you know, well cannot uh, do demonstrations. So, you know, there's been the events which have been uh, demonstrations have been prohibited. So, so not all of them, but in London, you know. Uh, they were not so for the country, uh, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité doesn't work, you know, and therefore, uh, 
Well, honestly, if you ask me if there will be peace or not, I think it will be complicated, especially today. So peace will come at one stage when you consider that we have to deal with your neighbor on a, an equal footing. And I think it, time has not arrived yet. Well, I said there would be, you know, a higher vision, not only an expert, but we had the height and the expertise. There will be no comment, but on a... Okay, we, we look back to what I said, uh, you know, a year ago, uh, yesterday, we've reached the, uh, the day. Talk about things that are uh, difficult without getting upset to uh, be able to talk about the real problems which suppose uh, uh, to be uh, heard, understood and uh, I think we filled uh, we fulfilled our contract thank you very much back in 30 minutes